Hi everybody, welcome to our first podcast on evolution and natural selection. Uh, in this unit, uh, we're going to spend some time looking at the theory of natural selection and its effect on populations. And we're going to begin by talking about some of the, the early theories and some of the conflicting theories uh, at the time that Darwin developed his theory of natural selection. I uh, just want to point out the chapters we're in right now. We are in chapter uh, 17. So if you have that and you want to have that out with you while we're going over this, um, and it will sort of blend into chapter 18 as we work through the unit. So here we go. All right, so first off, um, some of our principles that we have and our theories that we have on uh, evolution in terms of our modern theories are built over a significant number of theories that have happened over the course of time. Um, time you're going to hear that a lot. That is a big piece um, to understanding evolution is the role that time plays in all of this. And one of the things I just want to begin by saying is that the stuff that we're going to look at and the concepts we're going to cover deal mainly with those that hold their foundations in science. And there are a lot of theories behind um, the evolution and the origins of species that, um, you know, there are so many to learn about. So I hope that you'll spend some time learning about all the different types of ideas out there. Um, but for our stuff that we're learning in our class, we're going to focus on the ones that have their foundation uh, in the science field. So with that, um, some of the backgrounds of our modern theories uh, started with some of the ideas of catastrophism um, versus the idea of uniformitarianism. Um, the idea of catastrophism was, it, it, I mean, it's <laughs> just like it sounds a catastrophe. There was a major, major event, this huge catastrophe that wiped out um, a number of organisms and from that stemmed more modern type, you know, critters. Uniformitarianism is the idea that there was this change, but these changes happened in this sort of um, uniform pattern that they were consistent um, in the changes that we've seen in organisms over time. Um, now there have been a number of types of theories that have tried to explain why we have, one, the number of different types of critters that we have, um, why we have this fossil record that we can show change over time, um, and so on. So it's something that uh, is still building. Uh, one of the key pieces that I always think about is that, you know, nobody <laughs> around now was ever there um, way back when. So it's, you know, we're, we're building it off of what we have for the evidence we have at the time that we have it. So descent with modification, um, that's the idea that you have as the generations move on, you get this change that occurs and with every subsequent generation there's change to it. Uh, and that's one of the explanations and the branches, if you will, um, in an explanation for why we have so much diversity. Uh, and I really want to kind of clarify this idea of these two terms on a biological sense, diversity versus variation, okay? Um, biologically, diversity means that we have numbers of critters, uh, numbers of different types, okay? So different species. And so the more diverse, the more different types of species exist in a particular area. Now variation, which we've already mentioned that term a number of times in genetics, uh, deals with the differences seen within a particular species. So if we look at humans, we look at our class, we have a number of variations in our group because we all don't look the same. We have changes in, you know, hair color, eye color, you know, you name it. That's a variation. Diversity would be if I had a room full of us, um, you know, lizards, birds, um, bacteria, uh, trees, you know, I, I, if I had a number of different types of critters. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that distinction. Okay. So when we have, in terms of explaining diversity, this idea of generation to generation with slight shifts, the variations of these traits are going to influence the organism's ability to secure resources. Okay, so, you know, how well can you get food? How well can you find space, shelter? Um, and a lot of these, in terms of the, the theories that we're going to talk about, really revolve around, um, you know, wildlife. You know, we're going to, we'll, we'll bring us into it a little bit, but uh, that's kind of what we're looking at right now. And really, the ability to secure resources really plays a role in how 
well a particular organism can survive. And if they can survive, then they can reproduce. And this here, dear friends, is the key, okay? Can you live long enough to reproduce? Because that is the only way you are passing your traits on to the next generation, okay? You could have, you know, resistance to everything, be incredibly strong, get everything you need, and live to be 150, okay? But you don't pass your genes on, they die with you, all right? So that's just something to always keep in your mind as we talk about this. The real key is you are fit if you can live long enough to survive, to, to reproduce. So one of the key things in terms of this modern theory is that populations change as the variations accumulate over time. And that's sort of gonna be our working definition that evolution is change in the genetic makeup of a population over time, time again, that time piece. All right, so populations, producing more offspring than can survive, okay? Um, I always kind of go to the idea of, you know, I mean, think about it, it's pollen season, right? Pollen seeds, everything flying through the air. There is no way all of these are gonna create a new organism, okay? They make a ton, and this was, um, you know, sort of developed in this idea by Thomas Mathis, who was an, um, you know, an environmentalist, ecologist, um, economist <laughs> as well. Um, and he, you know, this idea that if you create more, um, you have a better chance for the population to survive because they're all, all of these factors really, really battling against um, the baby organism, if you will. There's starvation, there's disease, there's space, there's water, there's competition. Um, you know, you might be, you know, prey to something. Um, and so what, I mean, I always kind of think of finding Nemo, right? You know, Nemo survived kind of out of dumb luck because he was just the only egg that didn't get eaten by the big fish. So you've got this huge number of eggs, not all of them survive. So what does determine which organisms survive? What are the things? And, you know, like I said, in Nemo's case, it was dumb luck. So chance does play a huge role in this. And we're going to come back to this idea of chance um, in all of this. But let's talk about two competing theories because this was a time frame of the early 1800s, you know, early to mid 1800s. And there were some ideas behind why we see change over time and why organisms have altered. First one we're going to look at is a fellow by the name of Jean Baptiste Lamarck. And his theory uh, revolved all around the idea of what's called acquired characteristics. He thought that all species descended from a pre existing species, just like. Darwin talked about. It was just that he had a different way of explaining why that happened. And his explanation for change over time was that, okay, as a complex form, we must have come, you know, and derived from those that were simpler, um, less complex. Okay, so he said that everything has this sort of internal striving to be more complex. Now, structures in generation to generation, you know, of an individual will become stronger um, if they're used more. Okay, so meaning they'll become more often, they're going to become more seen if they're used by the organism. If they're not used, they're going to be lost over time because of disuse and it will eventually be lost. Interesting explanation, but the problem was is he focused on the change that was occurring to an individual. And then these changes that occurred to the individual over this idea of use or disuse were then passed on to the offspring. Okay. Um, due to this sort of unconscious, unwanting way for the, you know, to kind of get to a greater complex structure. Textbook example is the story of how the giraffe got its long neck. Okay, so here we are, we know our giraffes, right? Very long neck, very pretty, okay? But fossil record shows us that over time we have giraffes that had really short, stubby necks, and throughout time we, we see these necks getting longer, okay? So, if I use Baptiste, you know, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's um, theory, okay, the giraffe acquired this trait, okay? So what happened was this little stubby neck giraffe right here, okay, he or she needed to get leaves on the trees. And as the leaves, you know, were more out of reach, you know, stubby neck giraffe here would stretch, stretch its neck, stretch, 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 so that it could grab the leaf, right? Grabs the leaf but in doing so has stretched and its neck has increased in length a little bit, okay? You gotta use your imagination for this. 
stretches a little bit more, increases. So it's not a major, it's not like it goes whoop, you know, and increases its neck, but it increases it a little bit so it can reach the leaves and it grows just a touch. And there you have it. So now it was very useful, right? It's useful to have that long neck for that individual who has now stretched his neck a little bit and in doing so, then you know goes and has a baby giraffe and that baby giraffe because of that usefulness of that stretched long neck now has a longer neck when it was born i'm sure you guys are seeing the flaws in this idea right now <laughs> um, but and then that subsequent next generation as it stretched its neck more individually that neck stretches they pass that stretched neck along all right and then lo and behold we eventually wind up with the giraffes we know now who have very very long necks because it was useful to pass that on well problem is we kind of know that that's not the case and this was actually disproven um, in the late 1800s and it was disproven by a guy <laughs> kind of sad but uh, did an experiment where he took a bunch of mice and said okay if Lamarck's theory is correct then I'm gonna take these mice and he, he took the mice and whoosh, chopped off their tails Okay, um, lopped them off. Mice are fine without their tails. They were fine, they were happy mice, no problem. Okay, mice went on to have their babies. Well, if Lamarck's theory hold, held true, the mice didn't need their tail, it was not useful, therefore they didn't need it, so the next generation should have been born tailless. Well, the next generation was indeed born. All the baby mice had tails. So what did he do? He chopped off their tails. Those babies went on, grew up, had babies. All their babies had tails. So no matter what he did, he chopped them off. That changes to that individual did not pass on to the next generation. And so this sort of put Lamarck's theory kind of down the drain a little bit. But something has come up recently that kind of makes you wonder a little bit, and I'll come back to that in a second. So anyway, the story of the giraffe. Stretches his neck. That's sort of the example of how Lamarck's theories works. Well. At the time of Lamarck kind of solidifying his, his theory, we have Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. He does play a role in this because you know what? He came up with the same theory. It's just Charles Darwin kind of beat him to the publication of it. Uh, and Charles Darwin developed this idea of natural selection through his extensive trips that he took um, on the Beagle um, in the early, mid 1800s. And he took this trip where he went right around uh, Cape Horn in South America right around to the Galapagos Islands and was very fascinated by what he saw in the Galapagos Islands. He saw a number of critters that were very unique and not only were they very unique but they were unique to each of the islands and this really intrigued him as to why um, you know the birds if you will all the finches he saw were slightly different on every island um, and what he developed was this idea that the environment is what was selecting for traits that allow an organism to be most likely to survive. And if that trait that you had made you more likely to survive, then you were more likely to live, to reproduce, to pass your genes on to the next generation. So as Darwin's doing all of this, you gotta remember, we don't know about genes, we don't know about chromosomes, we don't understand that stuff yet. I mean, the mid 1800s is when Mendel went and did his pea plant study. So all of this is kind of converging all at the same time. So he just knew, and what everybody knew was that something was being passed from parent to offspring. And they knew this from selection, what we call artificial selection, where humans actually choose traits, like in you know, dog breeding or horse racing. Um, we select for the traits we want. You know, the winner of the Kentucky Derby this year, um, most of the money is being made because that horse is, is going to be put out in stud. You know, they're going to um, use them to breed and because people want those genes. Hey, fast horse, fast genes. So some characteristics get continually passed on if they stay in the person who lives long enough to reproduce. Others get eliminated because, okay, the elimination is not due to disuse. The elimination is due and is a direct result on the reproductive success of the parent. So like I said, if you don't live long enough to reproduce or you don't reproduce, those genes, those traits aren't being passed on. And so over time, if I have something that really makes me less likely to live, like, you know, my coloring makes me stand wicked out to a predator, 
I'm more likely to be eaten, okay, than I will be to stay alive and reproduce. So that's what happened. The result from this is that over time, there is a change. Oops, maybe. Over time, there is a change to the population. This is where Darwin and Lamarck's things really vary. The change to the population, whereas Lamarck talked about it being the change to the individual. So it's a big difference there. Lamarck said the individual changes, that change gets passed on. Darwin said, nope, within a population, the differences that are within a critter, okay, if you improves your reproductive success and your ability to survive, those were the traits that were going to get passed on to the next generation. So that's how that worked. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this variation. We know from genetics, variation is a complete matter of chance, right? It depends on what combination of genes you get from your parents. So chance plays a big role. If I have two heterozygous parents, there's a chance I'm going to wind up you know, with a homozygous recessive genotype. And if that's something like for Tay-Sachs, obviously my chances for survival are, you know, I, I don't live past four, okay? But that's chance occurrence, okay? So chance plays a big role in this. So it's related then to how genes have mutated over time and then their subsequent inheritance. So if a gene mutates and it's a beneficial mutation, the only way it sticks around and builds up is if it gets passed on. Okay. And we call these changes an adaptation. Okay. And you've got to be careful. As an individual, remember, we cannot adapt. Individuals are born with their genes, so born with their particular traits, so they either are adapted to or not adapted to a particular environment. Okay. The population will change or adapt over time. So the organisms that have those adaptations and are the best adapted to an environment have the better chance for reproductive success, have the better chance, you know, to live, and are considered to be the most fit, which is actually not coined by Darwin, okay? That idea of survival of the fittest um, derived from Darwin, but wasn't his term. But, again, like I mentioned earlier, you've got to be careful about the individual versus the population, because a population can adapt over time individual you're stuck with what you got but anything we've learned about this year that makes you think about wait a minute but we've seen things where it might be the individual change and then the individual passes that down I don't know if you can think about it well our look at epigenetics and our and the research on epigenetics has you know, sort of started to change our thinking because these are environmental shifts that are being tagged on the genes and those are being passed on to the next generation. So in a sense, as an individual, that change is happening that is being passed on. So something really interesting in that, you know, Lamarck might be going, hey, wait a minute, I was right. Um, so he is, but he's not <laughs> at the same time. As we learn more about epigenetics, I think we'll figure that out a little bit. One of the things that's a interesting story is the story of the peppered moth and I want you guys to kind of look this up and read about this again chapter 17 um, a really interesting story um, and it's something we'll come back to but um, I want you guys to look into that a little bit so I'm gonna hold off on that tale it's sort of a tale of woe um, slightly tale of woe um, a book known as of moths and men uh, was written to talk about the story of the peppered moth so um, We'll come back to that. So one of the ways that we can see actually natural selection work in and what we've been able to see in our lifetimes is the idea of bacterial resistance. Okay, um, and bacterial resistance has been a major problem because medically it's very very hard to combat um, these things. And so what you're looking at is a plate. Each disc has on it an antibiotic different antibiotic. And what you're seeing is bacteria spread on the plate and the bigger, what I refer to as the ring of death, <laughs> the bigger the ring of death, the more effective the antibiotic is. So you can see here, I've got a pretty effective antibiotic for this bacterial population. Um, I have some that have smaller rings of death, little ring of death here, and then I have some that have a complete no ring of death like this one, which means that this bacteria is completely resistant 
to this antibiotic. This antibiotic does nothing to kill them. And we've watched superbugs and we've talked about them a little bit and these, this is a really huge issue. And so what's happening is over time, bacterial populations have changed. Uh, and this is sort of the way it works. I have an original population of bacteria that are a mix. And again, even though bacteria reproduce through asexual reproduction, there's differences in their genetic makeup because of mutation. And so you have this different strains of the same species with varying, re, you know, varying resistance levels. Well, so if I go into me and I add that antibiotic, I am changing my internal environment. So for the bacterial's environment is changing because I'm putting that antibiotic in me. So this would be with antibiotic. So notice that most of these bacteria here with low resistance levels, just naturally, are killed. The ones that are left are the ones that originally had high resistance levels. Okay, they didn't change because of the environment. They already had the changes in them. It's just I added them and they happen to be lucky enough to be resistant to it. So now I've got these couple bacteria that have that high resistance. So what are they gonna do? They are going to reproduce. So once they reproduce, now I have a big population that has now a shift in the overall makeup of this population. This population here is different from that population change over time. So what happens is the next time I get sick or subsequent you know, years down the road, this doesn't happen overnight, we give the same antibiotic, guess what? Not gonna do much for the infection. And penicillin is one we've kind of, you know, kind of destroyed as a <laughs> uh, result. Its effectiveness is very low now. Um, so anyway, that's, that's sort of where we can see over the last 60, 70, 80 years, the effects that um, we've put, you know, we've, we've changed bacterial populations. And that's why you hear so much more about superbugs and um, these diseases that seem to be um, medically resistant. So anyway, that's where I think we are going to leave things for today and start talking about um, how we can actually see natural selection and, and play around with it a little bit. And from here, we'll get into some ideas of how change um, can occur. You know, what are some, what are some causes of change and, the, and things like that. So uh, have a great night and we will see you guys later. Take it easy.